He's going to have to remind me. As soon as I'm all right, we're going to talk macros, threads, and time travel. Um, give you a little background. My name is Creighton Kirkendall. Uh, I work with Closure on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I actually get to work with the wonderful people at Cognitech, who Karen works for. Um, and I spend a lot of time recently on doing development on the front end. Uh, and a lot of my obsession is in things like developer productivity. So those that know me know I've done a lot of different things trying to figure out how to make developers more pro productive. So a lot of this talk is really going to be somewhat an evangelism of ClojureScript because I do love it. But also, there's a lot of people all working towards the same goal. And it's not just closure script, but what you're going to see is some of the similar things that people are coming up with to make our lives easier with working with the browser. So hopefully you get to see as we go through here. Um, all right, closure script. Change the way we see the browser. How many here know what closure script is? Awesome, almost everybody. Um, closure is a Lisp. So as we go through this presentation, you're going to see lots of parentheses. Don't freak out. You will not learn how to program ClojureScript today. Um, you may not even figure out how to read the code as I talk about it. That's fine. Most of this is just to show you what's possible. Um, the beauty is, is I get to work with a lot of this every day. And you'll see that my development workflow and some of the toys I get to play with are pretty cool. All right, the current state. We have the browser versus the editor. Um, they're two separate environments today. Most of the time, we don't have a lot of interaction between the two of them. You basically save a file, you hit refresh. That's how you see your changes. We're going to see a slightly different setup today. The browser was designed for what's called a rinse and repeat, meaning that today, we tend to try to build these things called single page web apps. But the browser wasn't designed for that. Like, our whole development processes weren't designed for that. To get changes into the browser, to see the changes in the browser, when you edit even an HTML file, you have to hit refresh. Well, that really sucks on a single page web app. Um, and we'll see sort of how we get around that to some extent. Um, another challenge that we deal with on a day to day basis is how do we integrate designers and developers? Um, as we build these more complex apps that have much more elaborate visuals, much more sort of integrated UX designs into them, the designer is hugely important, but we end up writing almost all of it in code. Like, how do you, keep, how do you balance that so the designer still has control over the look and feel, but the programmers and that? What we've created are sort of super programmers that try to play both roles. And sometimes that's good, but it doesn't scale well. So we're going to look at some stuff like that. The browser is single-threaded. There is no denying that. There are some people that are changing that. Uh, I'm going to show today a concept of threads inside the browser that allow us to do certain things. And we'll get to see some, some, some cool stuff associated with that. Um, and then mutability. If you're used to programming in JavaScript, how many here primarily program in JavaScript or say Java, C Sharp, Ruby? That's almost everybody. Um, mutability is probably something you don't even think about. It's something that's your natural state of being. And what I'm going to show you is, is that it actually slows you down, both in how you think about problems and how you actually, even inside the browser. Turns out that not being able to change things allows me to speed things up a lot. All right. No, oh, that's not where I want to go. Huh. Look at this. Closure script, it's compiled. Uh, it is basically a language that's compiled to JavaScript. It's closure. It is closure, meaning that a lot of libraries that we write, even libraries I've written, I've written them so they work both in closure and in closure script. Like they can cross compile. Um, they're obviously, closure is a hosted type language which interacts with that. So there are some. 
things where we want to interact with native Java interopt versus JavaScript interopt, but in essence, the core of the language is the same, and we use the same constructs, the same sort of methods in ClojureScript that we use in Clojure. Um, now, you can see here that we have this nice little compile thing, all right? But there's this interesting little block here. It's a block that most of you never interact with, even in most compiled languages. But it's macros. Closure script has macros. How many here does C++ templates? Or some metaprogramming in Ruby? I'm sure some of you have done that. Um, macros are a type of metaprogramming. Um, uh, I keep hitting the wrong way. All right. It's programs that write programs. Now, ClojureScript has macros, and you don't know what you're missing until you see what you can do with it. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you some things that we have the capability of doing in ClojureScript that's very hard in JavaScript, or in, right now, any language that compiles it to JavaScript right now. There isn't a lot of metaprogramming in, those, in that area. Um, this is just a cartoon that I found very amusing. Dorky, I know. <laughs> ah, I keep hitting the, I gotta remember not to. What does it give us? Magic. All right, it gives us magic. Like, what I'm gonna show you is gonna feel a little bit like magic. At least I hope it does. If it doesn't, eh, well, I didn't do a very good job here. But, <sighs> it, it is. Macros give you the ability to do things that we can't do. What I'm gonna actually demonstrate is the ability to have HTML code Modify the HTML, code, save the file, and it immediately show up in a running app, as the, without refreshing the browser or anything. All right, so we're going to show up thing live HTML CSS updating with Figwheel and Keo. Keo is a library that basically it compiles HTML into React nodes. How many here know what face, Facebook React is? All right, so. Basically, Keo will actually take a raw HTML file and compile it in. It doesn't do it on the browser. What gets spit to the browser is, is the compiled JavaScript, which is actually the React code. Um, now, it, J, JSX, which is Facebook's structure, basically combines the two, which is the HTML is embedded with the JavaScript. Well, I want to separate those. Separate them because, really, the designer would like to work with just raw HTML in their editors. Like, they want to bring it up in the toys that they have. They don't want to actually work with the J JSX stuff. So the idea of this is to separate and provide the ability for developers to actually interact and use CSS selectors to actually annotate the code, like saying span username, content username. Like, to be able to say where and when. It's a declarative language for transforming the HTML into, a, into an application. That's what Keo represents. Combined with something like um, FigWheel, which gives you... Uh, i got to remember not to do that. So Keo takes HTML, takes our def snippet things, puts it through a little bit of closure, some closure script, and outputs React. FigWheel... FigWheel actually takes our CSS and our closure script, and every time we save the file, figures out how to get it back into the browser. Now, with a little bit of design knowledge of how that works, I can design an app that will actually run just fine and get updates live. All right. Um, you ha not, there's nothing in my app that's FigWheel specific. There is something in my app that says my, space, my state is only defined once. So if FigWheel actually tries to update it, it will only, it'll never re-stantiate the state of my app. And we'll talk a little bit about what the state of the app means. But in the way that we design apps in ClojureScript, and in particular with React, um, we tend to have this centralized concept of app state. And when we talk about time travel, you're going to see that that is key to everything. 
is the ability to know the entire state of the app and to be able to actually manipulate it, play with it outside of the app. So let's see it. Let's see what we got here. So I think if I go over to here and then I do that, what we will see. Ah, that's not it. Sorry. Uh, sorry, remembering all this. All right, what we have here is a simple to-do app, all right? So it's a really, really, really simple to-do app. Don't think anything magical here. I can go, you know, put a few things on here. I can click on things. I can get it to do. But what I have in next here is nothing more than HTML and Emacs. All right, nothing special about this. This is a raw HTML file. This is a running app with state. So I've already assigned to do things, but I can do something like this. Uh, to do, this is cool. Save it. It appeared directly in the browser. I can actually interact. Think about a single page web app where you've actually drilled down maybe several layers deep into pages and done an action that you want to do, and working on a component that you can only get through, through a sort of a complex way to get to it. But the designer can interact directly with it. Change it live. This is done basically because as this file changes, I base, all I do is I touch the, the, the CLJS file and it recompiles it and pushes it out to the, the, to the app. Because that Keo recompiles this and pushes out a new set of React nodes. React nodes just take in the state when it does rendering from the top. So we can kind of look at, at the code here. Uh, oh, Keo to do. I had this. This is basically the app. And what you'll see here is these little deaf snippets. We're going to blow this up just a little bit so you guys can see. These deaf snippets here. Let's get them up to the top. Basically, are turning this app into an actual application. So it's pulling in them live. You'll want to see the thing that actually makes this so that I can load it in and have it dynamic. Oops. Is this def once app state, which actually holds all my app state. The fact that it's only defined once means that it doesn't get reloaded each time Figwill tries. Um, but we're going to think, you're going to, as we go through this, you're going to see a lot of stuff associated with this app state. And you're, I'm going to show you sort of how we interact with it from a developer standpoint. Because in a JavaScript app, we just do variables. And before I got into ClojureScript and all that, I've done Angular. Um, I've done a lot of different things over the years. Um, the most recent was Angular, and I actually converted stuff from Angular to ClojureScript, in part because I had variables everywhere that were changing, and it was difficult to track through them. And when I came across this, what it basically gave me was the way to see how everything interacted in one place. So let's actually hop back over to, oops, sorry. All right, let's talk about threads and processes. So we've seen sort of how we have this sort of development environment that I can actually modify even the HTML. CSS applies the same way, it gets loaded the same way so they can change CSS and everything. So the designer can actually work with an, inter, an actual inter, interactive running app. Um, threads and processes, we're used to the browser being single threaded. We've always, We've sort of gotten around it. We program asynchronously because almost everything we do is driven by events. So, and we've come up with 
hundreds, if not thousands, of frameworks to deal with callbacks and of event queues and all of this other stuff. This is a library similar to those, but it, it has a specific purpose, and it gives us a way to sort of interact with things that's different than the way we're used to, in part because this is a Lisp, um, in part because I can do these macros that actually rewrite the code so that I can actually create green threads in the browser. And what I'm going to show you is sort of how that process works. It is part of the, the, the standard there. I actually work with Tim Baldridge on a day-to-day -day basis, and he's the guy that created it. And we'll talk a little bit of how he's atoning for some of the, the fun of it. Um, it is way more about coordination than it is about concurrency. Um, this is very important. Uh, most people, when they think about threads and about processes, they're thinking concurrent. Well, we're in a single thread environment. It's green threads at most. All right. There is no real true concurrency, but it is a lot about coordination. Like, how do we coordinate events? All right, inspiration. It's modeled after the Go language. How many here know, have seen the Go language? All right. Um, Go language basically is built off of the concept of very lightweight processes that all communicate through these concepts called channels. Core async is built off of the same mentality. It has these things called Go blocks. And we communicate almost everything exclusively through channels. Um, it concentrates on decoupling the suppliers from the, the consumers. This is, this is sort of a key concept. It is an event type bus system. Like these are channels. So you listen to channels. Pub sub type structures come out of this. Uh, when it's used for things other than that, you get kind of weird things going on. So, but let's see some code. All right, so we'll pop that back over. Oh, come on. Yeah, we'll just hit refresh and it should come back. All right. That looks pretty cool, doesn't it? All right, what that is, that is actually 10,000 independent processes running all concurrently, well, not concurrently, all in parallel in the browser. Um, each one of these little dots, they basically are simply deciding, eh, I'm going to change the color eh, sometime in the next second. And it basically creates this. But in essence, the whole thing is managed and it's done for you. I'm not doing any timeouts. I'm not doing anything like that. And what I'll show you is the client code. And a lot of this is about writing code that's easy to sort of understand. Like, if you've ever done animations, um, you know that you often write code that is basically a chain of callbacks that becomes very difficult to understand. And if you've ever actually done coordination with callbacks, that's even worse, because that's callbacks nested inside of callbacks that often need to go there. Oh, yes. There we go. All right, that's a, this whole program is right here. Everything that it does. All right, so if we look here, here's our go block. All right, that just says I'm going to create a process. I didn't do a lot with channels right now because these things don't need to talk to each other, but I just really wanted to demonstrate what the processes were. Um, in essence, I have a context for the canvas. You can see a little bit of how Java inter I mean JavaScript interop works. Like this is a property fill style of the context. Um, and I'm just basically grabbing out of my colors here a random color. All right. I then fill the rectangle. And then there's this interesting thing here. In Java, that would be sleep. Literally, in Java, we would do thread.sleep here. That's what that does. What it's really doing is saying, I'm going to read from a channel, but this channel never gives you anything. All it does is close after X amount of time. Channels are blocking. So inside this glow block, it actually blocks here. The beauty of this is I can actually write code that is just normal, standard code with sleeps in it without having to do chaining callbacks. This is really important for things like coordination. Um, 
Like when you're coordinating lots of events that have specific timings, it's a lot easier to do this than try to do it with, time, with, with set timeout. It's a lot easier to read the code afterwards. Um, but if you're not used to lists, this probably looks weird. But over time, it, it gets a lot easier. Uh, do times is basically just cycling through like number of columns, number of rows. It makes a cell for each row. Um, this is basically just saying I want to get the actual 2D context from the canvas. So, and then that's about it. There's not a whole heck of a lot with this. There is an index page to this that simply all it has in it is one element, which is the canvas. It has nothing else in it. It has one element, canvas, and the script tag that actually brings this in. But that's the whole thing. So that's actually. Plus, it's pretty, and it, it basically. I think so, all right. Is it rainbows and unicorns? I, I just gave you threads in the browser. This must solve huge problems. It does. It solves some problems. However, there's challenges to it. Um, in general, front-end developers do not have a lot of experience with concurrent programming. So you oftentimes look more like this than like this. <laughs> and I have dealt with this. Like I, I work on fairly large ClojureScript apps uh, for clients. And a lot of times, you'll get something that looks like that uh, because they're not used to it. So they tend to overuse it. Um, for some reason, there's a lot of people that what well, we refer to it as callback hell. But let's face it, callbacks are not bad. It's how we use them that sometimes is bad. They're great for singling, signaling, meaning that when I actually want to tell somebody that something happened, a callback is perfect for that most of the time. They're horrible for coordination. I mean, because you end up with callbacks that have callbacks that have callbacks, and you end up with a mess. So core async's thing is it is mainly for coordinations. Like its sweet spot is for high-level com component coordination. Now, most components should always expose just callbacks. And I've seen where they try to use channels in this because it gives you one way to think about things, but you end up just with a pile of mess. Uh, try to do it that way. All So that's actually, I think I can go this way. Let's talk time travel. This is the fun part. All right, because what I'm about to show now is much more conceptual. Like, it's where we get into the fun. Like, all right, I've showed you all this. What, what does all that give us? Well, that stuff and one more thing gives us the ability to time travel. Like, time travel like, like the doctor almost. I mean, we're talking there. My, my daughter gave me this quote, by the way. In fact, I, I, all I did was ask, like, most people assume and she finished it when I said it. <laughs> She's a big Doctor Who fan, so she, she was big on this thing. So we're going to talk time travel. How many here have seen Elm? And in particular, you'll see some of the things in here. The beauty is, is that because ClojureScript has certain things, it allows us to actually do things like Elm, which was designed from the ground up to allow for time travel. Well, I can roll it in as a library, which is a very powerful thing. Um, so first thing, immutability. I told you at the beginning that that, that would be a, a, a key thing to do with time travel. And it's a key thing to do with all this. I've said the centralized app state, the idea that I can see the whole state of the app. Well, not only does that centralized app state need to be there, it also needs to be immutable. And what does that mean? Well, there's these things called persistent data structures. And persistent data structure says every time I make a change, instead of actually changing that data structure, I'm going to give you back a copy with the change. And you still have a pointer to the old one. So you can never actually change something that someone else is looking at. This is important when we're dealing with sort of concurrent type structures. Like now that we have threads in the browser, we kind of need this concept also. 
But it gives us another thing. If I now have a pointer every time I make change and my app state is centralized, I can actually take snapshots and keep them. And I can actually turn the clock back and say, I want my app state to be that that was five seconds ago, not my app state that is now. And with technologies like React, we can actually render the entire app off of this app state. So rolling it back changes the entire UI um, back to the original state that we were in. We don't have to manage that. It's 100% declarative off of the state. And as long as you can keep that, you can get this really magical effect of being able to travel in time and have dev tools that actually allow you to travel in time which is actually the most cool part. Because how many here have ever tried to debug a program or a single page web app where you're, you're, you're deep into a component, you have a lot of things that goes, and it, you know, it errors. You don't know what happened. You don't know why it happened. But then you hit refresh and you can't reproduce it. Ah, what happened? This allows us to sort of do that. It allows us to sort of go back in time and say, what exactly changed for this thing to do this? What failed? Um, let's see. All righty. Welcome to the multiverse. All right. How many here have ever heard of what the multiverse is? All right. All right. Multiverse basically says that everything is possible. For every single event, we can go any, many, different directions, and if I picked this point in time, I could choose this path or that path, they both could exist. In essence, that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to basically go back to a point in time and say, I don't want to do what I did before, I want to do this new thing. And most of the time, if you think about that, you think about how you interact with the app, but I also want to think about it as, what about the code? I want to go back in time and change the code. Like, I've shown you that I can modify the app while it's running without while it's still in the same state, once I'm able to do that, if I travel back in time, I should be able to modify the app and restart it with different code at that point with that state. So it's a lot easier to show than explain. And the first thing I'm going to show you is what's called dev, dev cards. Dev cards are a it, it's, it's a really nice tool. I probably just made a lot of noise. Um, a really nice tool that allows us to sort of see the state for every single change and allows us to sort of interact with it. So, and it allows for some time travel um, for us to be able to do things. So if I go in here and I click, we can see that I'm adding, I'm adding some things and I can actually go back in time which is cool. But what's really cool is, remember that centralized app state? That's it. That's my app state. So when I go up here and I actually click on something, we can actually see where that changed. If you notice, that brick showed up. And if we click again, we can see as the app goes, as I make changes to the app, if I change this, Oh, we selected the question, selected the grass. The entire app state is encapsulated in this single object that, that shows us what all the changes that are being made. So I can go in here, put some grass down. We can see, we can see where this changes. I wrote this basically to try to build an engine that will allow us to build video games. Um, mainly because my kids think I'm cool when I'm writing games. <laughs> you think I'm joking, because I don't actually play video games. My son and my wife are really good at it and are very excited because we're getting a Wii U. Um, but I am really bad at video games. I mean, really bad. I don't know why, but my brain does not work that way. And my, my son makes one of me, and he's only eight. Um, but. They think I'm very cool, the fact that I can, you know, make a game. So a lot of this is I, I chose to show this because it, 
it's something that they think is cool, but there's also a, a neat thing. One thing with dev cards is you see, I can see the whole state and I can do that, but what happens when I'm going to own a big app? And I have a huge state. Or I'm dealing with events that are coming in at 60 frames a second. If I got to click back every single time to go back in time, that's going to be painful. That's hard. So when I was doing, working on a gaming engine called Pele, which I created a Pele, um, in essence, I needed a debugger that would allow me to go back in time, but that could deal with the fact that I was spitting out frame rates at nearly 100 a second um, and making modifications at that rate and handling things like a state that might have thousands of, of objects moving around like, and be able to know, see it. So if we look here, we're going to blow this up because it's too cool not to. Hold on, how do I do that? I'm on a Mac. All right, this is Mario. I'm going to hit refresh real quick just so that everything's nice and clear. But in essence, this is the Mario game. All right, there's the gaming engines behind it. Um, it basically handles basic collision detection, some basic stuff. But in essence, I can run around. I can, you know, jump, get my coins. Those should be spinning, but uh, I don't know. Um, but then we have a problem. Like, let's say I try to jump on somebody. Wait a second, I didn't kill him. I should have killed him. Why didn't I kill him? Well, let's actually stop this and put it into debug. Huh? Because I what? Well, that's true. That might be really true. Um, but I want to know why I didn't kill him. I mean, I should have, he should have died. I think he should have died. Um, but, you know, I really want to know, was he in the right state? And I just, you know, I haven't programmed it to be able to handle that state. Or did he not actually transition to the right state? So right here, I hit him. I know this because I bounce. I bounce every time I hit him. So right around here, I actually hit the thing. So you can see that bad is moving. This little bit right down here, if we look down here, we have some cool stuff here. That's actually diffs of the app state. This is saying what changed in the app state, what was added and what was removed. So if we look here, I can say that the bad guy, he actually now has an X of this, and before he had an X of this. And our hero, he's falling, his velocity Y is negative. He's falling down. You can see where his Y and X are. Um, he was at 1.2. You can tell that he's, he's falling faster. All right, so we have some concept of gravity here. Um, but if we inch forward now, we can see when he actually makes contact. Whoa, he's all of a sudden now going up. He was at negative 1.2. Now he's going up. So he actually collided with him. But the bad guy didn't, all that changed was his why. He should have died. I know he should have died because I programmed him to die. Well, what would be cool is if I could go fix that bug. So let's actually think I can go over here. Play. All right. Really, it's not a bug, but because I commented out the code. <laughs> Whoops, I want to, let's shrink this down. All right, so this is just a fancy way to do commenting. Don't worry about that. Most people, even in the closure community, look at me odd when I put that there. Um, but basically, I said, uh, collide action. If this body hits the top, if I hit the hero and I collide with him, I should kill the bad guy but it's commented out. So let's actually see what happens if I uncomment this. All right, and we're gonna go back a little bit. Let's, let's, let's go over here and let's move him back at, right before he actually hit the guy. So he's in midair. He's like, ah, oh. he's doing all kinds of cool stuff. So we're gonna save the code 
And you notice that little thing down here? It popped up. I'm going to do it again so you can see it. That is the cool stuff that says, hey, I, I made a modification and I just swapped in your new code. See my little CLJS logo pop up? That basically was Figwheel saying I, I put the new code in. Well, all right, so I commented it out. Let's see what happens if I restart the game. Ooh, he actually went back. Yay. All right, let's put him back. Be a, another thing that's cool, kids think is really cool. Woo, I can sit here and just play with them going backwards and forwards. Really nerdy stuff, I know. All righty, so let's actually put it. We can go. Let me get the rest of the coins because I just want to. Um, this little gaming engine is actually kind of cool. It'll actually allow, I mean, I can build basically any 2D game, um, which once I get the builder working, hopefully I can build some fun games and my daughter can build fun games. I'm actually building it so she can build games because she wants to build the little Minecraft type games and she, she loves that. And I'm like, well, what if you were building your own game? She's like, that'd be awesome. So I'm like, well, dad can do that. Um, let's actually head back here. All right, so I think if I go here, here's sort of the things that I used in this. Now, I'm not going to say, one of the things with Closure Script is when people first get into it, it's daunting to set up. It, 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 it has a, a learning curve. And there are people that are working really hard to make it easier. The person that created this and FigWheel, awesome. Those guys, they are making it much easier for new people to come into it. Um, and Reagent, actually, what you'll notice is I was doing 60 frames a second. The reality is it takes six milliseconds to actually render this. Uh, whoops. Which is ah, really cool. And I want to actually show it. Because if I go over here to my profiler and I actually hit, I'm going to hit refresh to restart the game so that. Let's profile this thing as I'm going. Whoops. Oh, it stopped. So we're playing the game. What you see, you see those little tiny things? Let's actually zoom in. 2.3 milliseconds. That's how fast that frame was redone. If you look right here. I'm like, this is actually going to DOM. I'm not rendering to even a canvas. That's SVG. And it's not because Chrome is awesome. The reality is the first time I tried to render this to SVG, I had to put it in canvas because I couldn't get anywhere close to 60 frames a second. Now I can get, I think, 140, and it, none of it gets weird. Um, but the reason being is, one of the resources that I was showing there was um, Reagent. Reagent works with React. And there's this wonderful thing. React has a very efficient rendering model. Basically does a DOM diff. All right, well, that combined with our immutable app state allows me to do diffs on both sides. So I can actually diff the app state and say, this is what changed and then only notify React on the changes that I have, and then it does the diff on those little pieces, and you can actually get way faster than you can do in virtually any other setup today. Um, it's probably the fastest that you're gonna find right now uh, because it's basically, it is actually handling it both on the, the app state side and on the the DOM side, making sure that the only things that actually touch the browser are actually what changed specifically. Um, which makes it very nice. It gives you very good performance. I chose the video game in part because, let's face it, most of us don't have to deal with 60 frames a second or thousands of different objects on the screen at a time. Uh, if you can get that to work, you can almost always get um, an app optimized to do it. Uh, Reagent's very cool. 
I've been working a lot with it recently. I've worked with Ohm, which is another one, ClojureScript one. Both of them are very awesome. Um, I've also wrote one for Outbase, <laughs> which was slightly more advanced than most of this that, that tried to do it at a, at a much lower level. So instead of the user having to know how to sort of configure the app, it just did it all on its own and figured out what the most efficient diff way on what should be diffed and when and tracking all that. Um, but that's sort of the cool thing. Like right now, the combination of ClojureScript and React give you probably the fastest rendering that you're going to find. Um, obviously, I've told you Core Async. Um, it has some challenges to it, but it is, it is amazing in how nice it can do for setting up sort of an event structure where components can talk to each other and coordinate. And then Keo and Figuel, uh, I've already talked about. Other things, obviously, uh, you'll notice that one of the cool things about Figwheel is it doesn't care what editor you use. That's important because one of the biggest challenges with ClojureScript or Clojure in general is there's a lot of us that are Emaxers, and not everybody's an Emaxer. Um, but there are now Cursive, which is IntelliJ. Um, Vim has a very good story now for, for Clojure. Um, but Figwheel allows all of them to sort of interact the same way with the browser and gives you all the same toys. Is Figwheel essentially acting as the web server? It is. It is. And, and so to do those refreshes, like your app in the, in the browser, it's maintaining like a socket connection back to Figwheel? Yeah. It actually has a web socket connection yeah. back to Figwheel. Um, and Figwheel can actually act as the intermediary between your app and the, the, the front end. So like, um, in other apps, you'll have a whole back-end system where you have different web sockets in that, and you have handlers, and Figma will actually wrap the handler and provide the additional features to allow this sort of interaction to happen without interfering with the app itself. And that back-end runs like in the JVM? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yes, and there's actually a really good story on the back-end as far as closures from a web development standpoint on the back-end. Um, like, from a standpoint of a whole stack, you can design something where people can go from the front end and the back end very easily, um, where you don't need a sort of dedicated front end developer because even the programming models can be unified. Um, although there's some hesitation to that because sometimes you need to know you're in the browser <laughs> or you get into the pile of, 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 of mess. Um, but you definitely can do some cool stuff. So with regards to that state changing kind of thing, um, we were talking about making copies of essentially the, that large state, right? Now, what does that start doing to memory? After what, how much mm. state do we keep? Oh, that's, well, the debugger is the only thing that's keeping the memory. Again? The debugger I have is the only thing that's keeping it alive. Gotcha. And for me, I had a thousand snapshots gotcha. is what I kept. And that was configurable. I could actually pass in different things to the debugger. Um, but, and I gave this talk at the last NCFP, and I, I probably will do it in the future even. Those persistent data structures are extremely efficient. Like, they're not really giving you a copy, a full copy. All they're doing is keeping the rest of the structure the same and handing you a piece. They're handing you a pointer to that new, that the old structure plus the change. So there's some beauty to that. Um, one of the cool things that allows you, like when we think that, that sort of copying, it's the reason why this is so fast. Because almost all, when you do a diff on a persistent data structure, almost all of them are identity checks. They're not actually looking at the values. Entire pieces of the tree don't change. And all it does is check the top level identity because really that piece still exists and is in all the, the past histories, it's the same. So it, 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 it's what makes this really fast. In fact, React uses a persistent data structure to represent the virtual DOM, much like Clojure's persistent data structures that represent the app state. So the two of them combined give you this sort of really, really efficient uh, diffing. I mean, in other things that have to use where they track variables, they actually have to diff the value. 
and on a complex at, uh, object, that means actually going through and chaining through all the properties and going all the way down the tree to actually look at the values because identity checks don't work with mutability. Like you have to take snapshots that literally capture the whole um, structure. Um, now some things get around that. What's the story like with that stack for uh, multiple connected clients and sending data between them? Um, like back and forth? Like, uh, like web sockets or oh, like yeah. having multiple um, users collaborating in your game, for example? Uh, I'm, I'm, I was working on actually trying to demo that, but I got a little ahead of myself. Like my, 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 what I thought I could get done in that was actually being able to control the, uh, another character from another machine. Uh, like, and I've done, I've done a talk before that shows like with core async and web sockets, I can actually create a really, and pass closure data structures around. So I can pass this app state or pieces of it between clients really, really efficiently. Um, and, it, and it gives you some cool things. Like I did a chat app, I think, one talk before when I was here at Gaslight. Um, but yeah, I actually want to do the game. What I want, my goal is, is to actually be able to publish these games to the phones and use Bluetooth so they sit next to each other and play against each other. Like that's the idea, is just to build games that allow them to do that. Because that's the kind of games my kids like. Like they like the, the fact that Minecraft, they can go in and, and, and go into each other's worlds. I'm like, well, that's really what I want. Um, but cool. Any more questions?